welcome to the Osborne Group Chat. I'm Karen Osborne, Senior Strategist at TOG, and I am so excited about today's topic and today's guest. We're going to talk about hiring and being hired in a, during a pandemic, uh, not to mention all the other things that are going on in the world. And I am so honored that Marion DeBerry has joined me for this conversation. I'm going to formally introduce her in a minute. I'm gonna read a little bit of her bio, but I just wanna say, hey, and thank you and say hi to Marion. Karen, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to this. I'm really, I've been looking forward to it. So I'm excited to have this conversation. So, and a happy 2021 to you. Thank you. You know, we were just saying that it's been a while since we've uh, seen each other. And I realized how much I enjoyed listening to you and listening to your wisdom and also your frankness. So I think our audience is in for a, a treat today. So I'm gonna read a little of Marion's bio because I didn't memorize it. So Marion, as I said, is senior, uh, she's a senior counsel at Campbell and Company, and she has over 20 years in executive search, plus lots of other wonderful uh, experiences. Uh, she, before she joined, Campbell and Company. She was president with two executive search firms and an independent executive search consultant. And then in addition to that work, her whole search life, uh, she has experience in the nonprofit profit sector. So she's been in your shoes, both in, ed in education and also in the corporate sector in commercial banking. And she has her master's degree from the prestigious Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. So she is quite the accomplished lady. And uh, that's where all that wisdom comes from, all that experience and all the different kinds of things you've, uh, you've done. So uh, today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about seeking jobs and getting jobs during a pandemic. We're going to talk about having a diverse, you know, a, a diverse and inclusive um, workforce, which is just so important. And we're so grateful that it's being lifted in this, in this time. Uh, you know, it's tragic how it came about, but now we're all focused and that's a good thing. But we're going to start with trends. Uh, kind of what the trends are. So Marion, I was reading an article in the Chronicle of Philanthropy and it reported that in December alone, the December that, you know, it was a month and a day ago, the December that just left us, 50,000 jobs were lost in the nonprofit profit sector. Do you think that's a trend? No, <clears throat> I don't think it's a trend. Oh. Okay. But having said that, I think there are a couple of things that are going on. Some of those jobs are lost, yes, and they won't come back. But I think in the areas, particularly in development, advancement, and programs, I think a lot of those will come back. They have to, but they because that work still has to go on. But the other thing that I think that's happening is that there's a whole new set of jobs that are coming online that we can't conceive of yet. And I think that's the real seeing around corner. There's gonna be new jobs that will come out of this work in this pandemic and this time that we just can't anticipate. So while 50,000 jobs are going away, there will be 50,000 jobs, but I, they'll be different. They will be, some of them will have the same title, but they will be different. They'll be different, yes. What, and we have to be prepared for that, don't we? We have, we have to really pay attention, uh, pay attention to that. Um, 2020, was a year of, of reckoning, of social justice reckoning. Uh, it got so many conversations. I can't tell you how many of my uh, not-for-profit friends reached out and said, "What do I do? You know, how do I how do I talk to folks? You know, on my job, and and how do I lead in this in this time?" And so I wondered how you see that uh, this reckoning playing out in the talent management you know, space? 
You know, I, you know, we always say that as you advance through your career, one of the ways that you think about work is you make sure that you have good networks, you make sure that you're known, you make sure that you're visible. And the pandemic shut that down for a lot of people because you weren't able to get out, you weren't able to meet, and when you did meet, it was virtually, it was virtual, and so you weren't able a lot of times to have those conversations where people really get to know you. But even with that, I still think you have to try to use the networks that you had in place to do that in order to get jobs. We have been pushing flexibility, flexibility around the interview process, flexibility around organizations and the hiring process as they also adjust to how they're going to bring people on. For instance, almost all the hiring process is virtual except in some very, very key and discrete circumstances, but the onboarding is also. Um, virtual. So because of that, that takes on a different flavor. You don't meet your teammates necessarily except again online. So the, what we've been saying over the past year is to be flexible about how the hiring works and to be flexible about what the state of the organization will be, for instance. Right now, we're all still virtual, most of us. So we don't know what that will look like in six months. <laughs> That's true. Let me just ask you this, though, as a follow up. In my experience, so many not for profits do a poor job of onboarding. You know, you mentioned onboarding, and now they have to do it virtually. But it seems to me that so many weren't doing a very good job beforehand. It's sort of, hello, how are you? Here's the mess that's been waiting for you. <laughs> you know, dive in. And I wondered as, a, as, a, as an expert in this area, because I know you want your, the candidates you place, to, you know, to be successful and, and have a good experience. You know, do you guys ever talk to people about that? Or what's your, what's your advice about onboarding virtually? We actually have an onboarding plan that we can give to organizations about how you think, but particularly if it's the new head of an organization and the kinds of meetings that should happen in the first 30, 90, 180 days, and also for senior leadership, what they, what they need to do. So we do talk about onboarding a lot because it goes to retention. It goes so much to retention. And particularly since you can't have the touches that you would have had if the person was there personally. Because again, they can't, they can't supplement their onboarding by talking to people in the kitchen or by going to lunch with people. They can't, they're, they're doing it a lot on their own now. So it's even more important that we think about the onboarding. Yeah, they've so got to yes. really have a plan and really think it through and think those steps through. And when it comes to, um, you know, trying somebody of, of color, somebody who's different, Whatever the difference is, it would seem to me that that even heightens the importance of that of that onboarding. It does. Um, yeah. it does but, but, you know, that then that takes us off into a conversation about organizations and where they are on the whole um, DEIA continuum and how they think about their employees, which is in itself an entire an entire conversation that we could spend hours on. But yes, you're right. Yeah. It is an important conversation and that we want our, our listeners, our viewers to, if they haven't already been thinking about how they're having those, we'll come back to that in a minute. But I, one of the things that I was talking to a colleague who like you, like me, spent so much of our time in airports and airplanes <laughs> before the pandemic, you know, traveling, traveling, and now remote work is become the norm and, and it's going to be that way probably for months and months uh, going forward. Um, how has that changed, affected the search process? Uh, the, the notion that not only that you're interviewing remotely, but the whole idea of working remotely, has it changed the skills? It, you know, what, what's the effect of that? It hasn't changed some of the skills. And actually there's one, there's one way that, the, that COVID has actually played an advantage in search, if there's anywhere that it's played an advantage is that sometimes you can have conversations a little more closely together because you don't have to worry about scheduling. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. that the time necessarily changes in the search, but you can collapse conversations and, and have them a little more efficiently. 
Um, so that that's one of the advantages that we see. But one of the things that organizations and candidates have to decide when they're going in this together is how long am I remote? There are some organizations, some organizations that we know are renegotiating their leases and they say we may never ever go back to live work. Others are saying we'll have some hybrid, we would like you to be in the office for a certain amount of time, but at the same time, if you're remote, that's fine. And there are others that are saying we are looking for ways that we will evolve so that people will be back in the office. On the other hand, you've got candidates now saying, I've shown you that I can manage remotely. I've shown you that I can be productive or you know, I'm proving to you that I can be productive remotely. I'm not sure that I need to be in the office all the time. So that's that's the delicacy that's happening. Yes. And we've seen some organizations, we had one who said, oh, absolutely. If they can't be in the city that we're in and we're really not interested, they hired a person from the other side of the country because they had, this person had such an accomplished record of what they had done. They said, we, we really need to rethink this. We've been remote for six months. That person's remote. They've shown their work. It's been working fine. Um, so that's, that's, that's the tell for organizations who thought, oh no, you have to be here and you have to be in front of us. Not true. Yeah. In those cases. Now, there are some cases when yes. When you have to. When you have to. I noticed that millennials are, seem to be the most interested in remote work. I mean, the research supports that. At, if I was a candidate, so you're, I'm coming to talk, you know, you're, you're uh, prepping me, you know, and for this opportunity, do I bring up that I really want to work remotely? Do I bring, you know, where, at what point do I, as the candidate say, and by the way, I don't want to turn it back on the organization. I, I, I would not bring up mine yet. I mean, I, I would make what I want it clear, but I would ask the organizations what, what your expectations are for people going forward so that it doesn't look as if I'm negotiating too early. But I, I, I want to understand. And we've had people say, if, if that's your stance and you really are looking that people are going to need to be in your city and in the office, I appreciate it. And knowing that I'm not your person and that's fine. Yes. Should they be sure to tell their search professional that that's important to them. Mm -hmm. And in the first conversation. First because conversation. We're, because we're advocating for you if we really like your experience and we come to the, to the client and say, Karen's fabulous. She is absolutely the person you should have. And then Karen gets to the interview and says, you know, I can't move. It's awkward, so. Yes. So Let it's sort of like first. your lawyer. Don't lie to your lawyer, right? Don't lie, <laughs> don't, don't lie to your search, your search professional. Be open. <laughs> well, but, but because that, and then you brought up a really good point there, Karen, is because I think lots of people think just because we work for the organization, we're hired by the organization that we don't care about the candidate. But that's not true because if we do it well, we're also advocating for the candidate and what they need. Yes. Yeah, you're working for, yes, you're, you're trying to help both because it pays for that match to, to be a good match. That's that's in everybody's best interest, including this, your search professional's best interest. You mentioned earlier about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I can remember being at a conference where you were speaking, you were on a panel, and and, and there were so many questions around that. The audience was mostly uh, people of color and people of differences. And they were asking you about uh, navigating as a candidate. And I imagine your clients are also asking you about that, you know, about how do I do this better? How do I do this correctly? And I just wondered if you had some advice for both the seeker and the, and the hiring manager. I know this could be an entire conversation, but just a couple of things that you really want both to be thinking about. <clears throat> I'll start with the hiring manager. The hiring manager is in the unfortunate place of having every organization in the country thinking about DEIA. So while that's wonderful for the candidate, 
for the organization, it means how are you going to structure your universe so that you can bring the candidates that you want? Because organizations will say to us, we want a diverse pool. But what does that mean? Because if you're in the Northwest, your diversity is probably different from South Florida. And what I mean by that is, if you are looking for representation because you want to make sure that there is opportunity, plus you want to make sure that your workforce is aligning with perhaps your, your end user, that's a different conversation. Mm. Now, you know, divert, so, so even though you want to look at diversity, you have to know what that means. The other part for a hiring manager is don't confuse diversity with inclusion. Yes. Inclusion yes. is the ongoing work internally of the organization. Diversity, if you do inclusion right, diversity should fall out of it. But at some point, diversity could become a numbers game that you can never win. Mm. Because in the natural attrition of an organization, you will have candidates that will leave whether they're diverse or not. It has nothing to do with you, it's just to do with their personal growth. So understand it's never an endpoint. For the candidates, you'll be looked at by a lot of organization, but be sure of what you want. And don't allow an organization to just hunt you. One of the things we say to organizations when they tell us we really want a diverse pool. We will bring you a diverse pool, but we'll not bring you a pool that is only diverse. Mm -hmm. Because now you're not searching, you're hunting. And to me, that's a different proposition. Yes, yes, yes. Also, um, isn't there a difference between a diverse pool and a diverse, you know, a desire to have a diverse pool versus a desire to have a diverse workforce? Yes. You know, yeah. it, 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 one is a commitment that's much bigger than this search. And, and, and the and other that's is- why we say, do you want a diverse pool or do you want just a pool that's diverse? Because that's, that's a different kind of commitment. Yes. And in my experience, that's been short lived. Yeah, it was, I was struck by, you know, this happened to me twice uh, recently of somebody asking me to join their board who I didn't know. I barely, you know, they're, they're a LinkedIn contact and and they are and I didn't know the organization. I, I I wasn't involved with it, and it was it was hunting. Now that you you say that, <laughs> I realize I was being hunted as opposed to being recruited. So thank you for that. That was I I felt very uncomfortable about it, and I now I know why because I was being hunted, which is an awful an, an awful thing. Um, one of the one of the things that. Uh, when people think about interviewing and, and, and asking the right questions, in my experience, and I know we didn't talk about this, but it just hit me that I really wanna ask you this, <laughs> is that so often the hiring manager talks and talks and talks and talks. <laughs> And they're telling them all about the organization and the job and the staff and the, and they walk away like knowing not enough about this amazing candidate that you had um, brought to them. You know, is, is, that, is that part of the executive search uh, consultant's job is to, to help people do a better job there or how does that work? We generally have a, we have a set of questions that that we like to give to the hiring manager or the search committee. And they're broken up in the areas that match up pretty closely to the position guide or the job description or however you want to, to call that. Um, and then each person on the search committee will ask a set of questions and then we'll move. And, and that keeps, and then, and then we act as timekeepers and that keeps that from happening where a person just talks and talks and talks. However, sometimes it's a clue because if the hiring manager is talking and talking and talking, and they already know about you, you're the person they want. 
They're and selling you. And they're selling you. Yeah. So, you know, be, be, be mindful of what you're listening for because they could be talking, you're saying, I, I need to talk them into the job. That's very good. That's, I love that. <laughs> So I, I love that. I also, I have a dear friend, Constance French, and she always says, remember that no matter how the interview is going, you want them to, that person to walk away with a positive experience. You want them feeling good about your institution or your organization. Mm -hmm. And that was always a good thing uh, to keep in mind too. So we are coming towards the end of our time together. I could talk to you for an another hour, but our I audience won't like that. <laughs> So I just wondered if you had any final thought. It could be something you mentioned already or something that you feel like you haven't mentioned, but something you want our audience to walk away with. One of the things I've noticed in the past year, let's go back a couple of years, I have to make this fast since we're coming to the end, is organizations would get narrower and narrower about what they wanted in a candidate. And of course, being search consultants, we would go out and try to find that purple unicorn. One of the things that's happened through this pandemic I've noticed is that when people are leaving, the organization is apt to look within the organization to see who they can fill. And it may not be someone that's in the same division. So this is an area where institutional knowledge is really carrying a lot of weight in a way that it may not have before. I can't say that it will always happen, but there are, are examples now where people have been able to broaden their experience because the organization says, you know, I can't really hire someone right now from outside, but perhaps just inside the organization, I can you know, find someone who's ready to be in another position, ready to move up, has absolutely shown their accomplishments, and so they could be a good bet for them. That's excellent. So if you, you're in the organization and you're looking around for something to broaden your experience, this could be a good time. That's really excellent. That's, that's excellent advice. I want to thank you again so much for uh, joining us today and giving us your wisdom and your frank. I knew you'd be frank. Uh, your wonderful wisdom. I so appreciate it. And I hope all of you have enjoyed this conversation. If you have questions, for Marion or for, for any of us at the Osborne Group, you can just write them in on our Contact Us page and we will be sure to, uh, to contact Marion and let you know. Meanwhile, I just wanna remind you, she's with Campbell and Company and you can find them. What's your website? www.campbellcompany and it's all one word, not Campbell and just campbellcompany.com. And my email is, is, is easy. M-A-D at CampbellCompany.com. Excellent. Thank you so much. You guys, Karen, thank you for safe. inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.